what's your working algorithm uh, for solving the problem? Right, so history, physical, we just talked about. So I think, and look, it's time consuming. And we have what, three minutes to see a patient? So believe me, uh, nobody has any time for all of this. We're, we're, we're all looking for a checklist from you. Uh, well, right, and so, so the checklist is going to include that history and physical, a, an accounting of medications, behavior, and underlying medical conditions and physical exam findings that may relate to particularly nocturnal polyuria. Um, avoiding diary, after also doing a urinalysis, we don't wanna miss hematuria, we don't wanna miss bladder cancer, every now and then there's a big bladder cancer in there, it can cause incontinence, it can cause LUTs, it can cause urgency. So we don't wanna miss that in a man. Um, think about PSA screening, it may or may not uh, be something that you wish to undertake as part of a nocturia workup. I don't think it's central, however. What is central and it's unequivocal is avoiding diary, which is a 24 hour accounting of time and amount of voiding. That, that would actually technically be a frequency voiding chart. Time and amount, you add subjective sensations such as an urge perception grade or degree of presence absence or degree of incontinence. Now you're talking about a diary, which adds some subjective uh, findings to the objective time and amount on the frequency volume chart. So the gold standard for a frequency volume chart is a 24 hour and technically three full 24 hours because there is considerable variability. Um, then there's a question of whether a nocturnal only diary would suffice. And the answer is yes, if one has excluded a 24 hour polyuria. That's the main thing from a 24 hour standpoint. If you have global polyuria, which you never find without the diary, no matter how good you are, no matter how much you talk to a patient, and even if they're on medications that cause polyuria, such as lithium, we don't know that they have it until they do the 24 hour collection. And that doesn't necessarily have to even be a frequency volume chart. A simple 24 hour collection to see what their 24 hour output would be would exclude global polyuria, which would be defined as 24 hour volume in excess of 40 milliliter per kilogram. So let's say in a normal average person, that would be around three liters. So if people are putting out three liters, they're drinking at least 3,700 ml. So they're drinking a lot. So why is that? Are they thirsty? Are they doing it because they think it's good for their kidneys? Are they dieting? Uh, do they have a behavioral problem or do they actually have a thirst problem? And Let so me see if I can make it uh, like a, a stepwise. So in the office, you talked about urine analysis uh, for obvious reasons. And then we do a post void residual, I presume. Yes. make sure they're not retaining. Yes. Um, now you're handing them a, a instructions to maintain this diary. And as they are leaving, before they're coming back with that information, is there a general instructions you provide in the period before they come back with that information? Yes. Um, I, I think it's reasonable to tell patients that they can drink in accordance with thirst and no more because thirst is rarely abnormal in any patient. It'd be very, very uncommon to find some hypothalamic problem or CNS focal problem that messes around with thirst. So if you tell patients to, to restrict themselves to a certain volume and they actually are able to stick to it, but that's not sufficient to cover obligatory losses, they will fall behind and they can become um, hypotensive. So it's dangerous to tell patients to, to, to intake a fixed low amount of fluids without knowing whether they can actually concentrate urine. However, if you just tell them, look, you know, you take your meds, do you, do you drink your each pill, do you take your pill with like eight ounces of water because you have to get it down or could you get that pill down with a gulp of water or a sip of water? If your mucous membranes are, are dry day and or night, do you drink a glass of water 
or do you just wet your, your mucous membranes? So that behavior in terms of minimizing the intake, not eliminating intake or resulting in a fixed intake, but thinking about intake and explaining to them that the dumbest kidney is smarter than the smartest doctor, then they get to realize that they don't necessarily have to, quote, flush their body to keep their kidneys going properly. That their kidneys will be just fine, even with less intake. So simple instructions, again, are to drink what your thirst says, but in terms of limiting at night, uh, because a frequent um, observation, or at least a complaint by the patient is, I'm always thirsty at night, either they're mouth breathers and or Otherwise, they wake up with a thirsty and they drink more in the night. So sometimes they're chasing their tail, more or less. Is That's that correct. Thirst? So you want to look at the meds they're on and see if any meds cause xerostomia. And see if they're on such medications, can they be exchanged for medications that do not cause xerostomia? There are many medications which cause dry mouth. And despite that, even if they don't take any medications that are responsible for the dry mouth, just because, for example, as you say, they're mouth breathers. So you tell them, when you get up and you're thirsty or your mouth is dry and all pasty, just wash your mouth out and maybe take a little sip rather than drink an entire glass. And that'll make a big difference. So what do you do when you uh, deal with excess urine output at night? How do you treat that? Well, that's nocturnal polyuria. And once we know that a patient has nocturnal polyuria, which is defined as greater than 33% of the volume of urine made at night as compared to the 24 hour. So that's, that's whatever that would be, let's say greater than 700 cc's or so, or greater than 90 ml per hour. That's an absolute, which is not de de determined by 24 hour output. So that, that's two definitions. So we first established a definition of nocturnal urine overproduction. That's nocturnal polyuria. So it's either the N NP33 definition, the 33% and nocturnal urine volume compared to the 24 hour, or the NUP90, which is nocturnal urine production in excess of 90 ml per hour. So let's say for eight hours, it's about 720 ml. And so once you find that they have nocturnal polyuria, you look for a cause. So we talked about behavioral, say drinking too much fluids at night for whatever reason. Then you look at something like sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is very common and it causes nocturnal polyuria due to the fact that hypoxemia causes pulmonary artery vasoconstriction, which causes increased pressure in the right heart. The heart thinks there's too much stuff in the vessels and it excretes atrial natriuretic peptide, which is a very potent natriuretic and it turns off antidiuretic hormone and causes tremendous diuresis. And that can be treated with, uh, with CPAP, with cont continuous positive airway pressure. So there's sleep apnea. Peripheral edema. So one of the first things I do in the office when someone says they're getting up at night, I lift up their, their trouser legs, uh, their, their, their pant legs, and, and see if they have pitting edema. You ask them, you have swelling in the legs? Do your, do your you know, shoes start to get tight at night? Some of them, they know they've got swelling. Some of them don't know it at all. And then you sort of push in on their pretibial area and you see the pit and they go, wow, that's, that's amazing. Um, so we've got peripheral edema, and of course that can be in a serious matter due to heart failure, or maybe it's just due to venous insufficiency, which is probably more common, or maybe it's due to dependent edema in people who stand all day. For example, people at work in a department store, people like us who are surgeons who stand long periods of time, um, or for example, people that just love salt, and people that are really eating too much sodium, and that will cause, again, fluid retention in the legs, which returns as, as gravity no longer is a factor to the central circulation and results in nocturnal diuresis. So, fine. And then, of course, there's also medications. For example, 
Some patients um, are, are given diuretics, and if they take their diuretic at night, that might cause nocturnal polyuria because you're inducing a diuresis during the hours of sleep. Um, we know that uh, there are diuretics that are short acting. They're given first thing in the morning, such as furosemide or hydrochlorothiazide. And it turns out that if you are, are accumulating fluid in your legs and you're, and you're waking up dry, then when you take your diuretic first thing in the morning, there's no, you can't get any drier than you're gonna be. So it's best to take a diuretic in midday if it's a short acting or in the, in the morning if it's a long acting drug such as chlorothaladone, which probably is a better drug for nocturia. The wrong diuretic and the wrong antihypertensive taken at the wrong time will clearly exacerbate nocturia. That's a study that was determined in, in, a, in a, the barbershop study that was published in the New England Journal in April of 18 uh, with Ronald Victor as the, um, the principal investigator. Very you interesting. You mean findings. there is no quick fix, 18 second, throw a drug at it and it'll get better. That's the frustrating thing about nocturia is it's only a symptom, it's one symptom, and it has easily 20 different underpinnings which means that it's, it's so easy to find things that result in nocturia, but because of the multifactorial nature, we only make little increments when we fix each factor. Many times, particularly the older the patient, the more multifactorial it gets and the more difficult it is to treat. In the younger patients, <laughs> there tends to be one or two big problems that can be solved with one or two major maneuvers, like, for example, sleep apnea. You got a young person with sleep apnea and they got nocturia, very high probability the treatment is going to just resolve it. Not too many patients you find like that, though. 